All right. Well, it is 12.01 and to be um, recognize everyone's time. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here. Welcome um, to this co-presentation of Hot Talks this month with the Cleveland Metro Bar Association and the League of Women Voters. My thanks to Michael Barron um, with the, the Cleveland League of Women Voters and Camille Wimbush um, for uh, your partnership on this today. Um, as many of you know who are not um, new to our Hot Talks, the CMBA provides these monthly discussions to create a civil dialogue um, on, on different topics throughout the community, um, sometimes controversial, sometimes not. Today, we are talking about judicial um, elections and party affiliation, so we will hear from two sides today. Um, thank you all for being here. We're going to hear from um, each side first, both judges. Um, and then after they've given their opening remarks, we are going to open it for audience Q&A. So please um, use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen for your questions and comments. We do want to hear from you. We do want this to be as interactive as possible. So please um, put, your, put your thoughts and questions down below and we will use those um, for our panelists today. <clears throat> and now I'm going to kick it over to Joe Gross, who for one, one more month, not even a month, uh, what does that say? July 13th, less than 30 days, Joe Gross is the CMBA president. So Joe and Camille um, from the League of Women Voters, please take it away. Joe, you're on mute. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining us. And thank you, Camille, and thank you, Michael with the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland in joining us and being able to uh, pair up to discuss a very important topic um, that uh, I don't know if it itself is a partisan issue, but it certainly talks about um, a, a partisan issue. So we have uh, two great guests and I have the privilege of uh, uh, introducing our first uh, guest, and that is uh, uh, Justice R. Patrick DeWine. Uh, Justice uh, DeWine began his six-year term on the Supreme Court of Ohio on January 2nd, 2017, following his statewide election in November 2016. Justice DeWine has served at all levels of the Ohio judiciary prior to his election. Uh, to the Supreme Court. Justice DeWine served for four years on the First District Court of Appeals uh, in Cincinnati, and prior to that, for four years in the Hamilton County Common Pleas Court, which is also, of course, in Cincinnati. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Law, where he teaches appellate practice and procedure. In addition, he's taught undergraduate courses at the University of C Cincinnati as well. Justice DeWine, under, um, uh, before becoming a judge, Justice DeWine uh, uh, practiced law in, in, at a large uh, Cincinnati firm. And be, uh, he was also a county commissioner and a member of Cincinnati's city council. Uh, Justice DeWine, it's a real pleasure to introduce you. Um, thank you. Uh, well, First, let, let me thank the uh, moderators, uh, the Cleveland Metro Bar Association, and League of Women Voters for hosting, hosting this debate. Uh, to me, this reform is really about transparency. It's about being honest with the voters. Uh, in our 1851 constitution, we made a decision as a state that judges should be elected. The rationale for that was that the only way to have judges who are truly independent is to have them answerable not to another branch of government, but to the people. Our constitution also mandates that judges run in partisan primaries. As long as that is the case, as long as we're going to elect judges and as long as we're going to nominate them in partisan prim primaries, I can't see any benefit in deliberately hiding that information from the voters. The system we have in Ohio now is an anomaly. It's an accident of history that vir has virtually no defenders among those who have seriously studied the issue. It came about not by any intentional design, but by the unintended intersection of two early 20th century reforms. Uh, in 1911, the Ohio legislature approved nonpartisan judicial elections. 
Uh, but then the very next year, voters approved a constitutional amendment providing for nominations to all offices and partisan primaries. So the unintended result of those two measures was to create a system that is truly bizarre. Ohio judges are nominated in partisan primaries, but then that information is obscured from the voters in the ballot box. It's as if someone thinks the voters can't be trusted with the facts. Indeed, while over three quarters of the states have some form of judicial election system, Ohio is the only state in the country that nominates in a partisan primary, but then keeps that information from the voters of the ballot box. No doubt, a party label does not dis determine how a judge will decide a particular case. As judges, our role is to apply the laws as written, regardless of our personal preferences about what the law should be or our sympathies towards any particular litigant. But there is plenty of research that shows party affiliation provides some indication about a judge's likely judicial philosophy. And while it's far from a perfect indicator, it is something that at least some voters might find useful. By being transparent about party affiliation, we allow the voters to attach whatever significance he or she chooses or to disregard it completely. In the academic community, there are few, if any, defenders of Ohio's current system. Really, the only people def defending the system are incumbent judges who have got elected under that system. Uh, those who we oppose reform saying adding party designation to the general election ballot will politicize the judicial system. I'm sure you'll hear that today. But telling voters that a candidate was nominated by a political party doesn't add anything additional to the system. Judges are already nominated by political parties. They already go out and seek a party endorsement. Uh, what adding it to the ballot does is simply make sure that voters are aware of what is already the, the, analogy, the reality. We, we, we also know that reform will increase voter participation in judicial elections. Elected officials, including judges, are supposed to represent the entire community, so we should want as many people to vote as possible. But under our current system, many voters skip the judicial elections. Indeed, last year, about a million voters voted for president, but then not in the state Supreme Court elections. Uh, so in 2021, about 16 to 18 percent of those casting ballots opted to skip the Supreme Court. And then when you get to the Court of Appeals, it's even a greater number. Adding party ID would change that dramatically. If you look at comparable states with partisan identification, places like North Carolina and Texas, you see roll-off rates from the top of the ticket to judicial elections about one and a half to two and a half percent, so a dramatic change. Finally, I'm sure you're here today that the reform is bad because it doesn't go far enough, that it's inherently suspect somehow because it only applies to state Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. And it is true that some of the same policy rationales to support adding party labels to the Supreme Court and, and the Court of Appeals also apply to other judges. But as the saying goes, you have to start somewhere. The question, the question isn't whether this is the perfect reform, but it's whether it is better than the system we have. And frankly, it does make some sense to start with the state's two highest courts. These judges are elected from larger geographic areas, so voters don't have the same kind of firsthand familiarity they might have with them in a smaller county or a smaller geographic area. In addition, to the extent that party affiliation might be an indicator of judicial philosophy, judicial philosophy plays a much larger role in decision making at the appellate and Supreme Court level than it does in the trial courts. So while perhaps the legislation could go further, incremental reform is far superior to no reform at all. To be fair, when it comes to electing judges, there are good arguments for different kinds of systems. There's good arguments for a purely partisan system, and there are good arguments for making judicial elections nonpartisan. Indeed, if you look at the literature, there's plenty of scholarly debates about which system is better. But what it is really hard to do is to make a good faith argument for what we have in Ohio now a partisan election system that masquerades as a nonpartisan election system. I say we start being honest with the voters, tell them the party identification of the judges for whom they are voting, and leave it up to the voters to decide what they want to do with that information. Thank you, Justice DeWine. Uh, now we are going to um, hear from Judge uh, 
Rice, and I want to give a brief introduction. Again, my name is Camille Wimbish, and I'll be co-moderating this event um, with Ohio Voice. And Judge Rice was elected to the 11th District Court of Appeals in November 2002. The 11th District Court of Appeals reviews decisions of the trial courts in Ashtabula, Geauga, Lake, Portage, and Trumbull counties. Judge Rice was elected by the other judges on the court to serve as the court's presiding and administrative judge in 2007. She has served on the Ohio Judicial Conference Executive Committee from 2011 to present and is currently the co-chair of the Criminal Law and Procedure Committee. She has a bachelor's degree from Purdue and her JD from the University of Akron School of Law and is a member of the Ohio State Bar Association. And this is my lovely cat who is super excited to hear from Judge Rice. Judge Rice, you wanna have a, a few moments to share your comments and thoughts on this? Thank you, Camille. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for uh, hosting this as well as the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. It's forums like this that people need in order to find out you know, what is going on in judicial races. But currently pending before the Ohio legislature is a bill that proposes to change how Ohio votes for judges. Proponents of the bill believe that adding the candidates party affiliation next to their name would increase voter participation in the election of judges. And at first glance, without considering the importance of the role of an independent and impartial judiciary, this would appear to be a good thing. But I ask you, at what cost? Judges are different. Judicial campaigns are reg regulated by the Code of Judicial Conduct to protect the public's confidence in the impartiality of the judiciary. Judges pride themselves on being able to set aside their personal views to fully and impartially decide a case based upon the law and the facts that are before them. Judges do not advance policy positions of a specific political party. They should not be elected based upon their political ideology. The judiciary was constitutionally created by our founding fathers to establish a third independent branch of our government as part of a system of checks and balances. The constitution established a system where the president appoints federal judges requiring confirmation by the Senate. In 1832, Mississippi was the first state to hold judicial elections. Currently, the majority of states choose the most qualified judges through nonpartisan elections or some variation of an appointment process. If Ohio passes this le legislation, we will be in the minority of states, approximately six or seven, who use partisan elections for judges. Partisan elections can imply that judges are beholden to the interests of their party and not to the law. This will undermine the public trust and confidence in the impartiality of our courts. Eroding the public trust in the judiciary is not any goal that our legislature should be working towards. As the, as the bill is proposed, it arbitrarily chooses to only require party designations for Supreme Court and courts of appeals. This approach is designed to leave the local judges as nonpartisan, but appellate and Supreme Court races as partisan. The proponents of the bill claim that it isn't necessary to add party designation for trial court judges because the people already know their local judges. I would challenge everyone on this Zoom conference to ask any voter who their local judges are. Without doubt, very few of them will know. Ohio appellate courts decide cases based upon the law as established by the legislature and the Ohio Supreme Court. Appellate judges must follow the rule of law the conflicts in the law are resolved exclusively by the Ohio Supreme Court. It would be more intellectually honest for the legislature to require a party designation to the Ohio Supreme Court races because political ideology influences that court decisions, but not the appellate courts. You can look at the campaign contributions and see that there are significant efforts by special interest groups to gain influence over justices through campaign contributions. Because our uh, Supreme Court resolves conflicts in the law uh, and matters of high priority, this is real reality in our current system. This doesn't happen in appellate races. Attorneys and people who know the candidates are generally the major contributors to appellate races. The attorneys who practice in the courts know the candidates' qualifications and their temperament. They want the most qualified judges with good judicial temperament. The Ohio uh, Senate and House heard opposition testimony from the Ohio State Bar Association, the Ohio Association for Justice, and Justice Piper on behalf of the Ohio Judicial Conference. Those who work closest to the judiciary 
believe the party designation on the ballot is not relevant information for a voter to use in making an informed decision when voting for a judge or justice. That testimony has outlined a concern that it is misleading to voters to imply that the party affiliation in any way affects judicial performance. In Ohio, informed voters would be aware, aware of their judicial candidates at the primary stage. And so if party affiliation is a crucial criteria for any specific voter, that information is available to that voter. It's not hidden anywhere. But the truly informed voters would vote for the candidate they deem most qualified. But uninformed voters will not always, while not always voting for judicial candidates now under our current system, because the lack of that designation would simply knee jerk vote for the party candidate with whom they affiliate. That is undesirable because we should not, as a matter of policy, want to stack our courts with individuals who may or may not be qualified simply because they have an R or a D next to their name. Party designations would undermine the goal of electing the most qualified and experienced judges by inviting an under or under uninformed voter to simply check the box based upon an abstraction that does not, under any circumstances, reveal a judicial candidate's merit. Many voters relied on the internet in the 2020 election because COVID kept them from participating in traditional candidate forums. Uh, the Judicial Votes Count website uh, was designed to provide voters with pertinent information. This is a website that was uh, worked through the Bliss Institute at the University of Akron and the League of Women Voters. Here in Cleveland, you have Judge For Yourself. Uh, Mr. Green from the Bliss Institute pointed out that there were tens of thousands of people who've used the Judicial Votes Counts website. Judicial Votes Counts provides extensive information on judicial candidates to interested voters. Let's tell the voters how to get the information they need. We can increase voter participation in judicial races by telling them where the information is on judicial candidates. We should have more forums like this to let voters see who it is they are voting for, but we should not mislead them into thinking that the only information they need is the D or the R. This approach conveys to the voters that the decision-making of judges is just driven by their party affiliation instead of the law. Well, thank Ohio, you. Uh, may I finish? Sorry. Ohio's current practice of making judicial races nonpartisan in the general election was challenged in Ohio Council 8 Ask Me AFL CIO versus Bruner in 2014. The Southern District of Ohio court held that a state's broad power to regulate elections includes the ability to decide whether or not to allow candidates to use the general election ballot as a forum for expressing their party affiliation so long as the permission extends equally to all candidates. And that's where I have a problem with this bill, to exclude the trial court judges, but to include the appellate judges with the Supreme Court makes no sense. House Bill 149, is, as currently pr proposed, will subject to con be subject, subject to constitutional challenge as a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, because similarly situated judicial candidates for different courts are being treated differently. Appellate judges are no different than trial court judges. When Justice Piper testified before the Senate in opposition of this bill, he boldly stated that the real motivation for the bill is because Democrats have won three of the past four seats in the Ohio Supreme Court. If the legislature wants to further politicize the Ohio Supreme Court, they can I honestly say that party designation is justified based upon the policy role that the Supreme Court plays. But including appellate judges is disingenuous and an effort to legitimize this political maneuvering. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you both um, for those lovely remarks and thoughtful remarks. I see we have many questions that have been populated in the chat. So why don't we um, start with um, so why, why do you think there were the selection of certain judicial races? Is there any particular, I know Justice DeWine talked a little bit about that, but I, I'm thinking some people are wanting to know, does this make sense? Um, are there other alternatives we should consider? Are there uh, one? Sure, ahead, sure, I can go first. You know, I can't speak to why the legislature selected the races they did, but 
I do think that, uh, you know, the question really is, is this better than what we have now? And, you know, a lot of the criticism I hear is, well, it could go farther. Well, maybe it could go farther and maybe that's, that's a reform for another day. But the question I think that you have to ask is, is what is on the table better than the current system or is it not? Because that's, uh, that's what's going to be voted on. And in, in my view, some reform is always better than no reform. And you know, to me, this is a pretty good place to start. And there, there certainly is a logic to starting with the Court of Appeals and, and with, this, with the Ohio Supreme Court. As I mentioned, these, these are offices that are, are farther removed from the voters. Uh, if you live in a small county, you're much more likely to know your common pleas judge or your municipal judge personally than, than if you, a state Supreme Court justice or a Court of Appeals judge who represents multiple counties. Uh, but more, but also if you if you believe what pretty much every political scientist that has researched the issue has found, that there is some correlation, how strong it is, you know, debatable, but there is some correlation at least between political party affiliation and judicial philosophy. And you know, with all due respect, if you look, if you actually look at the research, the research has been done not just on Supreme Court justices, but the research has been done on Court of Appeals justices. And there's a correlation between party. If there's a court, if you believe there's a correlation between philosophy and party, at least in some cases, then there's value in letting voters know that information. That that's a lot less true at a trial level where you're really not uh, where you're really deciding facts rather rather than uh, deciding the law. So, um, I know if I may comment, um, I testified before the Senate and the House, and at the time that I testified, I was told that the rationale for this designation for appellate judges and Supreme Court judges is because people don't people know their their local judges, and I think as I pointed out, if you ask anyone on the street what who's your judge? Do you know any of your judges? The, they probably won't. Um, so it's disingenuous to say that. Um, it's an effort to make it okay that they're doing this for the Supreme Court races. But as I pointed out, the Supreme Court races are very political. There's a lot of money that is contributed to their campaigns in order for special interest groups to try and influence or lean on you know, justices to hopefully get justices that will vote the way they want them to vote. Uh, other alternatives, there are many alternatives to how could we do this. One, we could go completely nonpartisan and not have a primary. And Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor in 2013 proposed just that, that we have judicial campaigns in a separate election off year um, and nonpartisan. As, and it, although you know we call this a hybrid system in Ohio, if you look online, at, you will find that it's uh, Ohio is treated as a um, nonpartisan election because the general election there is no designation for a party next to any of the candidates' name, even though there is a in the in the primary a voter is handed a ballot and the judge's name is on there. There is no D or R designation in the primary, so it's truly not a hybrid. It's just that the party is designated that we have to have a way to identify who's going to run in the fall. Um, so there's no D or R, although if you have a party affiliation and you're concerned about your judges, you get your ballot in the, in the primary and you can see who your party candidates are, or you can just go online and research it. Nothing is hidden from voters. This information is readily available um, and just a matter of looking it up. The concern is that people will stop looking and that they will only care about the D or the R. And then we get judges who may not be the best, or we will lose very good judges who are currently on the bench with a lot of experience, who've done good work for the state of Ohio. And now because they may not be the proper party for that county, they're gonna lose their job. Uh, this is evident in Columbus where three Republican judges have recently changed party designation to become Democrats in anticipation of the upcoming election. Uh, thank you. Um, the uh, Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association is part of the Judge for Yourself, as Judge Rice uh, mentioned, and the uh, information that Judge for Yourself provides is uh, completely nonpartisan, and uh, it takes great efforts in making it that way. It also gives a diverse uh, uh, set of opinions from several organizations uh, as well. 
my question to the both of you, and we'll go with uh, Justice DeWine first, is that um, the, the addition of a D or an R on the ballot with the addition of the D or an R on the ballot would, in your opinion, increase the number of votes for a judicial candidate or decrease the number of votes for a judicial candidate? Uh, we, we know from the experience of other states that it would significantly increase the, the number of votes. So in Ohio, in the last election, we had about a million people who didn't vo who voted for president, but then chose not to vote in the two state Supreme Court races. So I, it, depending on the race, I think that was uh, about 16 to 18 percent of the voters who didn't vote. Uh, even more, a, a greater number for the Court of Appeals. Uh, depending on depending on the seat who didn't vote. Uh, if you look at states like North Carolina that is honest with the voters about the party affiliation of, of judges, they have drop off rates that are around 2%. I think, uh, uh, it, I, I think North Carolina in the presidential election last year, about two and a half percent drop off rate. I think Texas uh, in the uh, uh, two years before that had about a percent and a half drop off rate. So it, it, it would dramatically increase the number of people who, who vote. Uh, and I get I guess what the opponents are saying is, well, we, we just don't really want uh, more people to vote in judicial races. But I think that's contrary to uh, the system that we have under our Constitution that puts that that puts uh, confidence in the voters to decide who's going to be a judge. Um, I, I would I would agree with Justice DeWine. It would absolutely increase voter participation. There would be more voters voting. Uh, the concern that I have expressed is that those would be uninformed voters who don't have the information that's necessary to, to understand who is qualified to be the judge in that particular race. Um, the, the most important thing is the appearance of, Im, of impartiality. We want to make sure that voters and citizens in our state and country know that the courts are impartial, that they will apply and follow the law equally to all people, and that it doesn't matter what party someone is, it's not gonna change how they're gonna do their job. So um, it's more of a concern about appearance. Um, it's clear that um, there's an interest in making sure that we judges are fair, impartial, unbiased, and not in any way um, deciding cases other than based upon the law. So I guess the point is, if there's more voters, if they're uninformed and they really don't know who they're voting for, then what value is that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what about um, helping us to understand what the role of you know, political parties is in the process of um, you know, running for judge? What kind of support do the political parties provide? And um, yeah, do you wanna start with uh, Judge Rice? Um, well, the political parties, as I said, in order to be on the ballot in the general election, we have to have some sort of system where we can identify the, the winner from uh, one party and the winner of the other in order to funnel it into the general election. Uh, so the parties are involved. They do have candidates that are um, affiliated with them. Um, but ab that's about it. I mean, to see what uh, the parties, the candidates pretty much run their own campaigns. Uh, we're limited in what we can say and what we can do under the canons of judicial ethics. Uh, judge, so you put a designation, a party designation on a candidate that says they're one party or the other, they may not have any ju judicial philosophy that, that they may be different. They may be a moderate, they may be uh, middle of the road and just you have to be on the ballot and to get on the ballot, you have to choose a party. Uh, so that's why um, judges do have to affiliate with the party. It would be much better if we had a system where every judge was an I and there was no um, party affiliation so that, that the, the voters and the general public would think we can go to the courts for fair treatment and everyone will be treated fairly under the law. Justice DeWine, response? Let me just start with a quick clarification. Just Judges don't have to choose a party. You, you have a perfect right to run as an independent. Uh, you can you can collect signatures. You don't have to affiliate with any political party, and you and you will be on the ballot. You collect the requisite number of signatures. So judges who 
ask for a party endorsement, they have chosen to do that. They have chosen to ask for that party's endorsement. They have, they have said they are a member of that political party. Uh, they have gone and collected signatures from other members of that political party to get on the ballot. And then they have run in a primary election where they are elected by members of that political party. Now, when you look at the role of political parties, the reality is that the biggest donors to judges invariably are almost always political parties. Uh, in fact, our, our rules say give a bigger spend, uh, political parties are allowed by Supreme Court rule, by the rules that apply to all the judicial elections in Ohio, to donate more money than any other donor, PAC or individual. Uh, so uh, political parties typically, uh, they'll have a, they may have an endorsement process. Uh, if, you, if you would walk into any Democrat or Republican dinner in Ohio any uh, given week, odds are pretty good you would see judges from one party or the other at that dinner. So to say that judges aren't nominated by political parties is, is, is really to be a little bit disingenuous. The reality is judge, under our system, good or bad, judges are going to be selected by political parties. The only question is, and it, is whether we're going to share that information with the voters or not. Uh, and when you, when you, I keep hearing these arguments about how telling the voters what is already the reality will somehow politicize the judiciary and lead to the appearance of impropriety. Well, I, I just don't think being honest with voters with about what is already true somehow adds politics to the process. Thank you, uh, Justice DeWine. Uh, Judge Rice, uh, this is a question uh, from our Q&A uh, from one of our uh, 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 viewers. Why is this proposal an amendment to the budget bill? This provision has nothing to do with the budget and should be considered only as a separate freestanding bill, which will allow full consideration and debate. Do you have any comments about that? Um, I do. It, it, is, um, it is always preferred that we have standalone bills so that it is open and transparent and it doesn't just get slipped through because we have to pass a budget bill. Um, tacking it onto the budget does um, stop the discourse and the conversation about why we're doing this and should we do this. And we've talked here today about other alternatives. If truly we want a fair and impartial judiciary, there are other alternatives um, to suddenly decide we have to put party designation on the ballot when the majority of states in our country do not. I mean, six or seven states have partisan elections. That's not very many. And there's a reason why people don't want partisan elections. It's so that everyone feels like they're getting a fair shake when they go to the courts. Justice DeWine. Um, oh, the question, the I forgot the question was about the budget bill. You know, I'll be honest, I don't know the intricacies about what's going on in the, in the, in the House and the Senate. I know that these were introduced as standalone bills. Uh, I don't know whether they will all be, if they're passed, if they'll be passed, passed the budget or not, but I know that they were uh, introduced as standalone bills. And, you know, I, I would assume that that, uh, you know, however it comes out uh, is the way it'll come out. Uh, but 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 let, let me uh, let me just react to to that last that that lap that last point as well about us being about there only being six or seven states that have partisan elections. Sure, we could have a debate. You know, that's a fair debate about whether you want partisan or nonpartisan judicial elections in Ohio. I think there's good arguments on on both sides of that, but. It's really hard to defend a system that says we're going to have judges who are nominated by political parties, but we're going to be the only state in the country that does that and then hides that from the voters. I mean, what what are we afraid of the voters knowing? So to build off of that, um, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of you know? partisan elections, if we were to stop where we are and say, let's re-envision our system, um, can you rattle off for the viewers what are some pros and maybe some cons? Judge Rice, you wanna go first? Um, well, of course, uh, the pros are, are what um, people are saying that elections are for the people to vote for who they want their judges to be. And that's absolutely a good idea. Wouldn't it be better if we took the time and effort and money to educate our voters so they know who they're voting for instead of just a name or a party? Um, 
special interest groups is the biggest downside to all this when um, the money that goes into the Supreme Court races is in the millions sometimes. A lot of money goes in there. And why? Why, why do people care? I mean, if, if you're, there's a reason they want to buy influence and they want to put judges in there who are going to rule in their favor for the issues that become uh, um, before them. Um, Nonpartisan elections, they, people still get to vote, uh, but then it's, you know, there's no affiliation with any organization or any group that would make someone think that if I appeared before the court, they're not going to be fair and impartial to me because I'm not their party or I don't look like them. I'm not, I'm not a male. I'm not a female. I'm, I'm not the right color. Um, you know, what is relevant regarding a D or an R that we need to put it on the ballot? Should we put that someone is, uh, what color they are, what religious they are? Um, I know Justice uh, R. Patrick DeWine runs as Pat DeWine. Should we designate Nate to his, next to his name that he is a man, not a woman? I mean, I don't know what do voters need to know. It's just uh, the money that's involved and the downside for special interests that can try and influence and get power through a, a, a branch of government that is supposed to be separate but equal. Thank you. Well, you know, we keep hearing a lot of red herrings. We keep hearing about money and special interests, but I'm, I'm not sure how either of those are affected by putting party labels on, labels on the ballot. I think that, you know, whatever influence money has the special interests are, are part of the system regardless. The question is, are, again, are we going to be transparent with the voters? Uh, I think the question was about uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of partisan versus nonpartisan elections? You know, I, I, I used to teach a class at University of Cincinnati on different judicial systems. I, I haven't looked at the research in a while, but I think that what uh, the proponents of uh, nonpartisan election would say, obviously, that you, you, don't, you don't have a party label involved, so there's le less influence by political parties. What the uh, proponents of partisan elections say, well, the, the advantages are that they have higher voter participation because people can more easily identify uh, with a judge. Uh, so you, you have, you know, to the extent that people are making decisions that aren't as well researched, or at least making them based on uh, a, par a party label rather than simply a name that they think uh, sounds good or, or is familiar, which, which often happens in these kind of, uh, you know, there's no party label, label attached. Uh, you know, it, there, there's there's a lively debate about this, and, and you know, there, like I said, I think there's you can read countless articles from academics uh, on both sides of the debate about partisan or nonpartisan. But you know, I challenge you to find someone who has seriously studied the issue who defends the system we have, which is uh, basically has all the, all all the, all the disadvantages of both systems. Uh, we we already have we have partisan. Uh, we have partisan nominations, uh, but then we don't get in it, but then we don't tell voters that. So you really get the, the voter roll off, the lower voter participation things you get in nonpartisan elections, but you still have the parties involved. That just makes no sense. Um, so that leads to uh, a question that I have, and that is whether either with or without the D or R on the ballot for appellate judges and Supreme Court uh, justices. It, is that more political or less political than the states that have some sort of a uh, legislature appointed system or a gubernatorial um, system where, of course, party might have an influence, right? So I'd like you to comment on that. Justice DeWine. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that's uh, the question kind of raises a good point. Even these systems where you say they're nonpartisan, depending on the design, they still have partisan elements, right? I mean, if you have, if you're nominated by a legislature that's one party or the other, or a governor that's one party or the other, generally, generally judges are going to reflect those, those viewpoints. If you look at the uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals, they are, um, they're not elected, but they're selected by a president, and there's correlations between the president's philosophy and the uh, and the nominees. There's plenty. Of, there's plenty. Of, there's plenty. Of, there's plenty of research on on that as well. So, 
you know, I think the what the advantage of the reform, at least, is that we'll be transparent with whatever politics are in there. People, people will get to see that. And again, the voters don't have, you know, I, I hope voters don't base on vote based on a party label. I hope they go out and do their research and find out about judges. But uh, I think that, you know, we're better off trusting them, giving that information and then letting them choose whether they want to do something with it or, or ignore it completely. Uh, and, you know, we're kind of drifting to a discussion of, of different election systems, different, uh, which, which, is which is a fine academic exercise. But the reality is, is that by our constitution, we elect judges. Uh, there have been several efforts to change that in Ohio. People seem to like electing judges in Ohio. Those those have all gone down you know, by large margins. And uh, our constitution also mandates part, partisan political primaries. So if we have that, you know, it would take a constitutional amendment to change that. So if we have that system, I think the, the question is, are we going to be transparent or not about it? All right, a couple of audience questions. Um, where do you find political party designations for judicial candidates? Where are the places that folks can learn about um, party affiliation or other information about judicial candidates? And how can the public get more education about a particular candidate's judicial philosophy? Uh, Judge Rice. Um, it's, it's easily available on the internet. And I think what we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, people were staying home and they were turning to the internet for information. And I think a lot of people realize there's so much out there that we can learn and educate ourselves on if we want the information. Um, so that's where you can find it. Ballot, Ballotpedia has the designation there. Um, the Board of Elections has the designation there. Um, so it's, it's readily a findable, define, uh, findable, there is no hiding someone's political party. So using the word hiding is just kind of like a scare technique, like people are trying to do something dishonest and that's not what's going on. So. Justice Dwayne? Uh, as far as where you can find the information, you know, the, the reality is the political parties generally mail out sample ballots to to members to people they think are Republicans or Democrats. If you if you go vote, there's probably be someone uh, standing there handing you a sample ballot with the Republican or Demo Democrat names on it. Uh, so people can so people can certainly find this information and go on the internet. Uh, as far as information about judges generally. Uh, we have the Chief Justice has worked with the uh, University of Akron on the Judicial Votes account website, which gives information about all the judges in Ohio. You can go in and you can type in your zip code. And it will tell you some biographical information about the judges who will be on your ballot. So certainly that information that that, that information is out there. Uh, but you know, but but obviously, uh, as much as we would like people to, and uh, you know, as much as we continue to try to encourage people to do so. Some people would like to know uh, when they when they get into the ballot box what the political designation uh, the judge who they're voting for has cho has chosen for themselves. And I think we ought to tell. Them. Here's a question: Why why only uh, judicial elections? Why why not other nonpartisan kinds of positions like? Uh, engineer or the law director of, of a municipality, which has party designation, but doesn't really reflect whether they have a political um, uh, leaning or, or not. So I think the question is why uh, judges why judges only don't have party designation? Yes. Yeah, I. Uh, that's my question as well. I mean, it, it's it seems to me uh, pretty odd that uh, every other uh, elected office, by and large, some some municipal offices, by you know, lo localities get to choose whether or not they're partisan or nonpartisan. So so some cities may have charters; they have nonpartisan elections. But by and large, uh, when when people vote for uh, different offices, auditor. Uh, treasure. I'm not sure there's a Republican or Democrat way to 
collect taxes or, or to audit the books, but uh, uh, we have chosen as a state to put party designations on, on, on those offices, um, to, at least to people who have chosen to run in the partisan primary. And I think the same logic applies. The judge chooses to run in the partisan primary. They shouldn't uh, be unwilling to let voters know that when they cast their ballot. Okay, so let's assume um, this proposal passes, you know, for, for folks who are concerned about, you know, perceived additional uh, partisan influence over judicial elections. Are there anything, is there anything that can be done to sort of mitigate these fears or potential harms that might come? Justice DeWine, you want to start with you? Sure. Um, you know, again, I don't think this changes anything. I mean, this is the you're going to have judges who are endorsed by political parties elected to office, just like you, just like you do now. The only, the only difference is going to be what the voters know at the ballot box. Uh, but you know, we, we do, we do have a series of ethical rules in place for judges. Judges, judges are different, uh, and those rules apply uh, whether this reform passes or not. So I think from a judicial uh, ethics standpoint, this really doesn't change anything, and. You know, I hear criticism that this proposal doesn't go far enough because it doesn't apply to, to all judges. But I think, you know, one thing it does do is give, let people look at how it works. Uh, if people like the system for uh, appellate judges and Supreme Court justices, and then, then they can go expand the system to include more, ju more judges in Ohio. So I think it's a good start. Okay, Judge Rice. Emil, I'm sorry, what was your question? Oh, you could feel free to answer the question of, um, for folks who are concerned about if this passes and they're worried about additional partisan influence over our elections, what could be done possibly to sort of mitigate those fears or potential harms that you might see coming out of this legislation? Well, I, I think that's the problem. It's the appearance and how, I mean, we as judges are bound to avoid the appearance of impartiality. And by doing this designation, that's out the window. There's, there's no avoiding the appearance of some sort of bias or leanings. Um, so there's really no way. And the, the problem is, is that it brings into question the impartiality of the ju judiciary. Um, as you see what's going on in Columbus, three sitting judges have left the, the Republican party because the trend is Republicans are not winning elections in Columbus. So they're going to switch parties now because truly Democrat and Republican doesn't matter for your job as a judge. So it's, it does create problems because now people who are experienced judges aren't gonna be elected. Um, I do not think there is any way to uh, help people get over the concern that there's going to be influenced by the parties on who's sitting on the bench the problem you run into if you have a single party county like you have in Cuyahoga County, there could be a potential um, input from the um, leadership in the political party as far as leaning on judges like, hey, we got you in this position. We helped you get elected. Why did you vote that way on this case? Why are you doing this? That's the, that is the corruption that we cannot have in the judiciary that has to be avoided at all costs. And it's the appearance of impartiality that the code of conduct has put before us as judges. When you put a D or an R next to someone's name, we have to follow still, as Justice DeWine pointed out, the um, code of conduct. We can't talk about certain things as judges. You can't talk about how you would rule on a case. You can't talk about um, a lot of issues that could come before the court. So what you're doing is you're putting a D or an R next to somebody's name and you're tying their hands behind their back and shoving them into the boxing ring and saying, good luck. Can I just respond to that real quickly? I mean, we're not putting, you know, the legislature's not putting a DRR by someone's name. The judge has already chosen to run in that primary. And that's, and that, and that's true today. Uh, I mean, it, it's a little, it seems a little absurd to say that, well, we, do, we won't ha have the appearance of, it's okay for judges to go to a political party, ask for their endorsement, to run in a primary, ask for members of that party to select them as their nominee, for a judge, for, for a judge to take campaign contribution from a political party, for a judge to go to political party events, but then to say, oh, but if now we actually tell the voters that they're, part of, they're a member of that party, then we're going to have an appearance of impropriety, and then we're, it's going to be a problem. I mean, 
let's let's be fair. I mean, let, let's just be honest with people. I mean, if, if we have this system where judges are running in partisan primary elections, there's absolutely no justification for hiding that information from the voters. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll give you each uh, uh, an opportunity to close. And, and my question to you is this, from a, and it goes to what you were just saying, Justice DeWine. What are the practical uh, impacts if, if this legislation passes with regard to uh, judicial candidates getting funding and maybe getting uh, his or her name out um, more, um, will it have a bearing on how political parties uh, support judi their judicial candidates? Um, Judge Rice, would you go first, please? Um, I, don't, I don't believe it will have any impact. Um, I think the system will go on as it has been designed. Um, the political parties will still fund and support whatever candidate you know, is part of their party. Um, I don't think it's going to matter about funding. Um, I think we still see um, millions of dollars being funded to Ohio Supreme Court races. Um, so that's going to continue. Uh, but, but what it does is it, it calls into question whether or not the judiciary is truly impartial or whether someone has bought influence with them. Uh, whether or not they took contributions from First Energy, for instance. I mean, there, there's problems within our system that the judiciary should stay away from. And as judges, many judges, they're friends of mine, we stay, we stay out of it. We don't wanna be involved in politics. We didn't run for a political office to be you know, a legislator or a senator. Um, we chose to the judiciary because that is where we can do the most in furtherance of a better law for our citizens. Well, I, I think what Judge Rice said at the beginning is absolutely right. This, this won't change anything. You'll still have political parties who will uh, support candidates just like they do today, political parties who will do mailers for candidates, political parties who will urge people to vote for uh, certain judicial candidates or not. The, the only difference will be that we'll be more transparent about it. Oh, it's about five till uh, uh, one o'clock. Uh, we should give closing argument or give your closing position uh, since we gave uh, uh, Justice DeWine the uh, opportunity to go first. And we'll give Judge Rice the opportunity to go last this time, uh, primacy rec re uh, recency for uh, those of you who care. Uh, Justice DeWine, uh, would you please give your closing remarks? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I want to, again, I want to thank uh, Judge Rice for being part of this. Thank the League of Women Voters, the Cuyahoga County Bar Association. Uh, you know, as, as, I, as I pointed out, the reform will improve judicial elections by ensuring that more voters participate in the process, making judges more representative of and more accountable to the people they serve. And that's important. But in my view, even more important is being transparent with the voters. Ohio has chosen to elect its judges and has chosen to do so through a partisan primary system. That's not likely to change anytime soon. So the question on the table is, are we going to be honest with voters within the system that we have? Are we, are we going to tell them which political party nominated the judges on the ballot? Or are we going to continue to be the only state in the country that keep that information from them? Uh, you've heard, a lot of you know really what I think are kind of red herrings talking about money and polit money and judicial races, uh, different corruption, whatever. This doesn't change whatever concerns people have about elections. This doesn't change any of them. This doesn't. Uh, this isn't going to lead to more money in judicial elections. It's not going to lead to less money. What it's going to lead to is people knowing what party the judge is on their ballot have chosen to associate with them, with. No one forces a judge to go out and seek the nomination of any political party. But when they do that, when they are selected by a, by a political party, it only makes sense to do what we do for every other office and to do what every other state that has this kind of election system does is and share that information with the voters at the ballot box. So you know, 
it's, it's really quite simple in my mind. Are we going to trust the voters or are we going to continue with a system that deliberately hides information from them? Thank you, Judge Rice. Um, thank you. Um, I think the concern that many judges have is that we, we, we have seen in the past five years, a serious polarization of our country based upon party designation. Um, that is not what the court system is about. The court system is about where people can come to resolve their disputes fairly and impartially, where not, none of the outside influences should come into play. Um, it's, it's the polarization um, of the country should not come into the judiciary and therefore make people think that this judge isn't gonna like my case because I'm not of that party. Um, I just think it, it leads to a uh, distrust in the judiciary, a lack of confidence in that we have a system that protects people, uh, not money. That money that is put into the um, political process in order to get these judges elected at the Supreme Court level. Um, you know, yes, there's, I can tell you there's never been an independent candidate for the Ohio Supreme Court in my lifetime, because it's not a reality in our current system. Too much money is funneled through the parties and there has to be a party designation. Um, you have to affiliate some way in order to even survive the race. So uh, to say that there won't be any change, I, I would debate that. Uh, if a um, Republican ch or chooses to run in Cuyahoga County, um, a lot of people will look at them and say, you don't stand a chance. You're not going to win. I'm not going to support you. I'm not going to give you any money. I'm not going to help you. You may be the most qualified, best judge that we could ever have on the bench, but good luck. You, you can't make it, so goodbye. Uh, we don't want that. We want judges who are fair, impartial, educated, have a good work ethic, have good judicial temperament uh, in order to preside over our cases because all citizens appear before the court, not just Democrats and not just Republicans. And thank you so much for having us today. It's a very important topic that's very important to the judiciary and we appreciate you taking an interest in it. Uh, thank you, uh, Carrie or Camille, do you have any last words? So my last words would just to be for, for folks who are still uh, interested in having their voice heard at the legislature, this bill is still pending before the Ohio House. So if you want to contact your state rep and let them know whether you support this bill or whether you oppose this bill, you can do so, but just by going to ohiohouse.gov and contacting your lawmaker. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Justice DeWine. Thank you, Judge Scott. Um, thank you to the League of Women, Vot Women Voters and Michael Barron for partnering with me on this. Um, great program today. Thank you all for being here. Stay tuned next month for our next installment of Hot Talks. Everyone have a great afternoon.